preparing to be on Clipboard and a Whistle with Jason, and he's going to introduce me shortly. And so, Jason, I'm ready. All right. Well, here we go. I'm your host, Jason Oates. Are you ready to be coached? So, then let's get started. I'm thrilled to introduce my guest today, Coach Bill Patton. So, Bill, are you ready to coach us up? I'm ready. I'm ready to coach you up. Awesome. So, Bill, take take a few minutes here, just a little bit of time. Tell us about you personally. Kind of give us an overview of your coaching history. But most importantly, which coaches had the biggest influence on you? You know, it's funny. I've, I'm really uh, – I'm a tennis coach, but, in, but really – I'm a football coach who coaches tennis. So uh, my, uh, my most influential coaches were John Madden of the Oakland Raiders, um, Tom Landry of the Dallas Cowboys. And, um, you know, those are really, I think, my top two that I really closely observed when I was a kid because you could see them on TV all the time. I'm an East Bay guy so you know the Raiders are my team and you know John Madden's passion uh was just amazing I just loved to watch him throw a fit and uh the incredible love that he had for his players was was amazing uh, and then you know those were some crazy teams uh the other thing was Tom Landry his incredible composure at all times you know his he never ever showed emotion during during the games, I mean, he might give a fist pump, you know, at the end of the game, but you didn't see any ups or downs with that guy. So really solid citizen, and I think he was a rock for his players. So, um, so those were my, I think, my very earliest um, influences in coaching. Obviously, you know, I've done a lot more study since then, and the, the list is long. Uh, but so I won't get into all that, but I've been coaching 29 years and mainly tennis. Although, you know, I've spent some time coaching inner city kids. Uh, we worked with them playing some basketball and did like a little mentoring program here in East Oakland and, um, coached my son's soccer team as an assistant coach with my friend for five years. That was a blast. And, um, and then generally with my kids, I was the dad that's kind of stayed in the corner and didn't bother the coach uh, because I know what that's like when you have parents who are overbearing. But, you know, I might, if there's, if I see something, I might take them aside and, you know, give them a little, you know, here's what I see. And then they can do with it whatever they want. I don't have an agenda. They don't have to follow my way. But, um, but now where I'm at is I've been writing books and the two books that, um, that I think are most applicable general to coaches are uh, Play Sports Right, um, which is actually written to kids, but it's a great tool for coaches. And then the next book that, and that'll be coming out really soon. That's going to be relaunched. Um, and I'm in the kind of in the finishing stages of a book called Athlete Centered Coaching, which, um, which that is, has been a lot more complicated than I thought it would be. And I think what it's going to end up being is a collection of essays. Each chapter will be a, a new idea. And it's just going to be food for thought for coaches to be able to um, understand their athletes better, draw the most out of them, you know, understand issues at play um, from – the culture from the psychological standpoint, from the family standpoint, you know, health, fitness, um, you know, choices, um, empowerment, all that stuff. So that was more than a minute. <laughs> no worries. So, you know, kind of the athletes, athlete centered coaching book and that kind of stuff. And, you know, and what's on the clipboard, we like to start the interview out by asking our guests to define the word coach, what it means to them. It's kind of our way of getting, getting to begin to understand how you coach. So, Bill, what does the word coach mean to you? Well, I see the coach as being uh, the hub of a bicycle wheel. So, you know, with all the little spokes, and each player is a spoke. So in order for the wheel to roll really well, then that hub has to be strong. You know, so um, if you had a if you had something that was not a very incredibly solid, strong thing in the middle, then 
it's going to be really tough, tough to tune those spokes really well. So I think what that tells me and us is that, and you listening, is that it's, gr it's really important to have a kind of a rock solid coaching philosophy that you've developed. And if it's not, then get it that way, you know, shortly, that will really help. Um, the other thing is a coach is a visionary, a leader. I think one of the most important traits of coaching for me is having a vision for what's the best my player and or my team can be. And then, and then finding w ways to solve the problems of getting us from where we are to that place. And uh, that's really challenging and also very satisfying. No, I love that visualization. I'm a big visual guy. And so the, and, and I actually love to ride bicycles too. <clears throat> so, you know, having <laughs> those two in there and then just that solid, that solid vision, that solid foundation. And one of those things that goes along with that is kind of our passion. Like, so Bill, what wakes you up every morning? What gets you fired up to coach? What gets me fired up to coach? Um, it, it's funny. I, 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 I'm, I don't know. I really don't know, but uh, I like to win. <laughs> so um, one thing that's, one thing's been uh, really takes people by surprise is you know they hear the way I talk and they they see the way I you know I act and all that and I think they don't often see how incredibly uh, competitive I am so you know I like to win and I want to compete everything's a game I just you know I just want to win 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 all the time and you know I used to take losing really hard I was the kid when when you know they were eight you know would fall my eyes out if I lost you know or throw a tantrum I'd you know knock the chess board over all that stuff I was the crazy kid that wanted it way too bad so um, so I really I really like those kids I like the ones that have all that passion um, but um, you know then it, over the years of maturing, really, it's been the satisfaction of seeing um, young people become more competent and able to do something that seemed like it might be impossible. I mean, that's that's really the most satisfying thing that happens for me. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing that on a you know daily, weekly, monthly basis. So, you know, I think that has to be maybe one of the, the favorite things for me or the, the one of the things I really enjoy the most is those kids that, that show up. And I coach a lot of rec sports. I, I say that I've coached 53 seasons um, <laughs> from the age of four to the age of 24 from, you know, basketball, football, baseball to cheerleading. So it's one of those, like, got the gamut of everything. But the kids that, that come in don't really have a lot of skill or kind of sheep is shy. And, you know, watching those kids get better and then let's just say basketball wise, like they make that first shot, the yeah. first shot of the season. And right. one of their teammates that was better on the team, like was consistently passing them the ball and telling them to shoot. Like that's when I get like really excited about, yeah, we've got something here because the kids that are good are lifting up those kids that aren't so good. And then that kid that wasn't so good got to experience that thrill of the ball going through the hoop. Yes. And that's, that can be a life-changing, life-saving thing that happens. So that is awesome. And so I think it's both sides, right? The kid that's really good helping, but then the kid that's not so good succeeding and, and, and how that all works together. And that's, yeah, and that's like, that's why I'd love to coach little kids still. Um, and also because you have to really know how you teach what you teach, because if you don't, those the little kids they find it out really fast and they, they'll if they if you don't know what you're doing they, they check out and they you know go do their own thing absolutely <laughs> so bill i like to start every one of my practices out with a quote or a thought for the day because most of the kids that i coach are going to go pro at something else so can you share with us a quote or a thought for the day and how you've applied it to yourself and or your players Yes, uh, I think one of the major ones is that good is the enemy of best. Um, that that one of the most important missions is to teach excellence in what we do. So um, that's, that's really critical. That's mission critical for me. So 
Um, you know, we're here doing our absolute best to be as to be the best we can possibly be right now and in the near future. So it's all about improvement. Now, what's really tempting for people in general, I think that you know the default is that people stop at good enough. You know, that was good enough, right? Um, and yet. You know, if they just went a little further, you know, they could be their best. They could be the best at what they did. And and the rewards for that are 10 to 100 times greater for going a little further. Um, so I sometimes joke with parents uh, of the high school kids I coach that I will, I'm going to take your kids to the edge of death, but but I'm not, we're not going to go over the edge. So... When, you're, when your kids come home really tired, you'll know why, because I was torturing them for two hours. <laughs> Torture. Torture, yeah. yeah I, you know, I look at it kind of the same way, and I try to make sure that, that, that we concentrate on that getting better. And one of the things, I don't know if you look at it this way too, but, like, I hate the word perfection. Because, mm. you know, if you, that, that, and even the, like, let's practice perfect. Well, if they're practicing perfect, then they're afraid to fail. And mm. that leads to not improving. So I try and remove that fear of failure from my kids so that they can go out there and make mistakes for me at basketball or whatever, kick the ball around um, because they're trying to do something just a little bit past what their abilities are at the moment. Well, yeah, and I think that's a great point because in at, at a certain point, though, they gain a certain level of maturity where – where you can strive for perfection, but will you ever get it? I mean, I think the greatest example is one of the best coaches in the country ever is the De La Salle uh, football coach, you know, that they won, they won, you know, 10,000 games in a row a couple different times. And, um, right. you know, I think, and, and I greatly admire him and that program and the way they operate and the way they only have 12 plays, but they run them to perfection and they will run a play over and over and over again until everybody's foot goes exactly in the right place. They have the, they have the feet marked out on, on the field. Your foot is supposed to be here, not there. And that I think is a really important life lesson to pay that close attention to detail. Um, and yet they don't take it too far. It's not like some of the things you see in the movies, you know, where, um, you know, practice has been over, should have been over for an hour and a half and they're still running that play because it's not perfect yet. I mean, they, they end practice when it ends, but they might pick that play up again the next time, but they run their 12 plays to perfection. And when they insert a 13th play, you better believe the other team is completely fooled. I was going to, I thought you were going to say when they insert a 13th play, they remove one of the other plays. So they had practice. No, 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 no. I've, 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 I'm a fan of a team that's actually had to play that team in our sectional championship here a couple of different times. And when the 13th play arrives, the entire defense is completely shocked. It's like their uniforms had been removed suddenly. <laughs> uh, no, it's just an amazing thing to look at. Yeah. To see a, an entire defense completely fooled. So we're kind of leading into to failure here, which is the next topic. So it was on the clipboard. We realized to fail is to learn. Mm -hmm. So can you share with us a coaching or playing failure that's helped you become better or help your players? Uh, yeah. And um, I hope you all appreciate this. I hope you appreciate this because I'm really going to put myself out there. Um, it was in 2008, 2009. I kind of, personally, I was, you know, I was kind of going through a weird time in my life. And, and I kind of started kind of getting into this pattern of, of, you know, sort of coarse joking, which was entertaining for some of the kids. I mean, maybe even most of them. But, um, but I, I kind of developed this blind spot where, you know, here I thought I was really funny and entertaining. And yet I didn't realize that I was becoming um, more and more offensive. So, so I got a reality check on that, a really, really strong one. And, um, and that's part of, I mean, it's one of those things, it's like a blessing and a curse because 
because I had to take stock at that time and really consider what was I doing? What did I want my reputation to be? What's my legacy? And, and so I, at that point, I really started a pretty massive shift in my mindset to try to uh, strive for a greater level of excellence with my players. Um, so, you know, I don't even really want to go into too much detail there. I mean, I'm really sort of embarrassed by it, but, but I'm pleased now that it's, um, you know, almost 10 years later and it's led to um, writing these books and writing them with, you know, from, from my own pain that I've experienced. So, you know, it's an, it's an interesting temptation that coaches have sometimes to, to be friendly with their players, to be a friend of their players. Uh, I mean, I think you can be friendly, but um, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. And, um, you know, we read in the newspapers about, um, about times that coaches being too friendly became um, really a bad thing. Gotcha. Yeah, it's, I guess, you know, with the, with the failures, the biggest part is what do we do? What do we change? How do we become better from them? And, you know, if, if writing those, if, if those were, if that failure was kind of the, the, the spur to write those books and share with other coaches, how they can get better, how that stuff um, has changed. I mean, that's now, now that's a, a, a huge turnabout. It's a huge win for everybody else. Cause you know, if we don't have to make the same mistakes that you did, then we're way better off. But you know, that's, that's one of the reasons I actually love reading books and have read a ton of them recently. Yeah. Well, you know, and, and it's interesting because one coaching position that I, that I got, I came on the heels of someone who'd done something really horrific. Um, and so I kind of had to rebuild a program from, from a, a pretty catastrophic thing where the, the coach went to jail. So, wow. yeah, I'm sure that was fun, but in the same sense, when, when you turned it around or when the kids then got back to being able to enjoy the sport rather than worrying about whatever else was going on, I'm sure that was, that was fulfilling for them and for you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, cause then you get, you know, it, you get to change the course of something and that's always, that's always fun. Awesome. So, Bill, I like to call the next segment the fundamental four. So pick a skill that is essential to success, I guess, in tennis or life or in coaching and break it down into the fundamentals of that skill so that we can help pass on your knowledge to our players. Okay. Um, how about if I do one quick and then one a little more detailed? That's fine. Okay, thank you. All right. So I had a chance to interview um, a guy named Torben Ulrich who – played Davis Cup for Denmark into his 50s. An amazing, amazing individual. And many people are familiar with his son, Lars, who is one of the founders of Metallica. And, uh, and, and maybe could have been a, a professional tennis player, but he chose music in his teens. You know, he, he switched to going fully for the music. Well, anyway, so I asked Torben, I said, what is it? How is it that people are going to learn tennis? And I think this is also generally true about all sports. And so Torben said, well, Bill, I think you need to know what you're doing. And so, so the general tip that I will give you as, as a coach listening to this, as a parent listening to this, as a player, know what you're doing. Be, be self-aware. Um, you know, understand your technique. Understand the way you approach your teammates in, in a relationship. You know, know, know where you fit in the team. Know the effect that you have on everything around you. Because if you know that, then you will be able to detect if things are going right or wrong and you can make changes. But if you are not self-aware, if you do not know what you're doing, then how are you going to make a change and know the difference? So that's the general one. Um, specific to tennis, 
the most important moment on a tennis court is when the ball and the racket meet. And so one thing, a common misconception about the way people play is that they think it has, it has something to do with the way they swing the racket more than anything else. But really, it's about how well do the ball and the racket meet. So, so the most fundamental thing that I do with my players um, from the beginning is I get them to establish their contact point. Uh, and that contact point is generally, so if you're facing forward to the net, and then you turn yourself slightly, about 45 degrees to the right, then you want to make contact with the ball approximately 45 degrees away from you, which um, you know people can conceptualize. And if you watch professional tennis and observe that closely, you will see that more often than not, um, all the great players are making contact approximately 45 degrees away from themselves. And then, then there's also an ideal distance away from you that I can't really describe because it's a very personal thing. It's based on your grip, how tall you are, how strong you are, you know, how long is your arm, all these different things. But each individual has a contact point that is, you know, this ideal distance for them. And so knowing what that is is very important. And so if you know it, just simply knowing what it is helps you to actually figure out, am I getting too close to the ball? Am I too far away? Um, you know, and so what happens is that as people get more aware of their contact point and get better at hitting the ball there, then it, it releases their confidence to really swing away because then it, it's almost as though the ball were sitting on a tee waiting for you to hit it. Um, so then to practice that, uh, it's good to start with, with, you know, a ball and your racket and having it 45 degrees away from you and discovering that contact point and just looking at where that is. Uh, then, you know, if you have a ball machine or you have somebody who will, you know, toss you some balls, make a very, um, not not too challenging movement situation where you only have to take a couple of steps before you're making contact. Uh, and then, then, you know, once you've got that mastered, then you can go, then you can, you know, slowly increase the challenge level and move in different directions and sort of sort out how are you going to move in this direction to make that happen. So, so it can be scaled up into very high levels but ultimately uh the way the game is played these days the first player to get the other player to hit a play hit the ball outside of their ideal contact point has a, a tremendous edge over the other that's pretty cool I, my grandfather uh, play a whole bunch of tennis and was a chair umpire and that kind of stuff and so uh, but I never played myself but just thinking about contact point and how it relates to, to baseball because it's baseball season for, for my kids right now mm -hmm. and in contact point on the bat and wood bat versus aluminum bat that right. kind of stuff and so yeah that makes sense because there's that sweet spot <clears throat> on the racket there's that sweet spot on the bat that if you hit it man the ball just jumps and it doesn't feel like you're hitting the ball whereas if you hit it <laughs> in the wrong spot or not where now you oh, really yeah. feel it, the ball doesn't go as far. Well, and you it's get that vibration power, coming up the bat, which is not a lot of fun. <laughs> Especially when it's cold and you're playing with those bees. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so you talked about the, the practice plan for, for how to find your uh, sweet spot uh, in terms of hitting the ball, but how can we practice, you know, knowing ourselves, being self-aware? How do you do that? Uh, I think I think the number one thing is listening. Uh, you know, when when I mean, I think first observing, really watching, you know, and thinking while you're watching, what's happening here? Asking yourself, what's happening here? You know, what effect am I having on this? You know, am I a, am I a positive? Am I a negative? There's nothing in between. You know, you're either you're either advancing things or you're not. You're making things worse. So, 
Um, so that, that's a good thing to ask. So observing closely, you know, stop, look, listen, right? Um, who, 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 I forget, let's see if I can remember this one. It's stop, look, decide, act, stop, look, decide, act, stop, look, decide, act. So, so you know, it's, it's this process that you can go through. You can stop and you can look at what's happening. Then you can decide what you're going to do next. Then you act on it. Then you stop and you look at the results of what just happened from that decision. That's one way to do it. And then the other is to listen. I mean, when people, when people give you feedback about your effect on them, listen to that. I mean, when you're getting praise, then you must be doing the right thing. So you want to do more of that. Um, if you're not, if you're getting something else, then pay close attention and, and listen to what people say and interact with them on that. Try to understand what's happening. Um, you know, sometimes people are critical of one another and it's not the person, it's the, the person who has the issue is the one who's critical. So it's also, I think, healthy to know when, that there are times to discount other people's criticism of you. Yeah, it's that's an interesting point there. With you know, it's you have to you have to understand the messenger um, to understand the message. I guess would be a, a way to put it. Right, but even if you don't agree with the messenger, and you know, this is this happens to me still. I mean, I I get some pretty interesting feedback from some people, and. I sometimes get angry feedback that surprises me in it, and but uh, but I try to really understand what they're saying. You know, they they say, "How could you do this?" I'm like, "Well, I'll tell you exactly how I can do that." I mean, this is this is who I am and what I do. This I've actually become this and wanted to. So you don't understand it. I'll explain it to you. Okay, I guess we agree to disagree. So fire me. <laughs> and then sometimes too, there you know, there's a little bit of truth in what they're saying. Sometimes that sting. And then when we when we sit back and and self evaluate, yeah, um, you know, we look and then we decide, and we either we ch decide to change something or not. But at right. least we've taken the time to yeah. you, you know to to look at that. Well, and if we go back to you know my epiphany, right, which didn't feel like an epiphany, it was it was much more depressing than that. I mean, you know, I got some feedback from some people that really caused me to stop and take stock. Um, one, I, one of the funniest ones was um, way back, way back. I was a very young coach, and I was pretty sarcastic with the kids, and uh, it was largely meant to be funny. And one, one girl came up to me, and she said, Hey, coach, you know, when you joke like that, I don't really, I don't really like that. So... So I said, okay, Jenny, that's fine. Thank you very much for coming and talking to me. I won't joke like that with you. So, uh, you know, it was, it was good. I mean, and it really, it's, it, I appreciated the fact that she had the courage to come talk to me and do that. So it, it made a difference. I'm still pretty sarcastic, but, you know, I, I am more mindful of um, doing it in the right spirit and making sure everybody gets the joke. Because if they don't, right. they, if they don't get it and it's and it hurts them, then it's wrong. Yeah, I I jokingly say that I was born sarcastic. I came out and spanked my mom in the rear end. So um, I think that's kind of my <laughs> sense of yeah. Heart. Wow. How did how does she like? Does she hear that still to this day and and find that funny? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she does actually, oh. but because she's had to deal with me my whole life. Okay. Um, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So, so you know, Bill, as we kind of continue to coach, we learn from failures, successes, and we add tools to our coaching toolbox. So what is one tool you think every coach should have in their toolbox? Um, to never underestimate the effect of what words can do. Um, I learned something amazing that was, I, this is crazy how good this is, but um, I have a friend, Australian coach, and talk about sarcastic, that guy's crazy, but um, we were talking, 
my team was coaching his team in kind of a friendly match. It wasn't, it wasn't an official match, but we were having a fun time. And he said to one of his players, play better. And I'm like, wow, well, that's, hey, thanks, coach. That's obvious. And he says, oh, you, oh, well, he said, but watch what happens. And then sure enough, his kid played better and beat my kid. And I was like, what happened there? And he says, no, you don't understand what a powerful cue that is. Because what's the alternative? When people are playing poorly, when especially kids, because they're not very good at you know modulating their emotions, um, then they tend to get angry. They tend to uh, make excuses. They can... Um, uh, you know, get into these little negative patterns of, of negative thoughts, right? Instead of focusing on what they want to do. And what they want to do is they want to play better. But they think self-criticism is the way. So, um, so I started to experiment with that. And I've actually come up with something where I go to my players and uh, they'll be going through a rough patch where they're not playing very well. And this will, a lot of times we'll even do this in practice, especially in practice, because if you, if you establish this in practice, then you can, then you can push that button in play in the, in competition. If you haven't established it in practice, then it may or it's like, it's an iffy situation. So, so, um, so we're having a rough patch, pretty much universally, the whole team or group has bogged down and not really playing very well. So I bring everybody to the net and I say, all right, you know what you need to do? You need to play better. So repeat after me. I want to play better. I can play better. I will play better. And then it's like a light switch went off, uh, went on. And all of a sudden, they raise their game. It's a, it, and it, sometimes it takes a little time for them to process. But out of a group of so many players, almost always one player will immediately raise their game, and then the others quickly follow. And then in a matter of minutes, the, you know, that last straggling player can do that. So it's a really important thing. And I've used that in my own recreational sports that I play. I mean, I, I used to play a lot of basketball and, um, you know, I wasn't the greatest, but, uh, I enjoyed it a lot. And sometimes I'd be playing poorly and I would stop and I would say, I want to play better than this. Um, and, and I could actually have raised my own game by doing that. So it just sounds so simple, but really it's very effective. You know, I think you hit on a great thing. Just something that's a, a few words, just a couple words, doesn't have to be profound, but we've talked about it with our players in the past, and so they have an understanding of what it really means, the deeper meaning of those couple of words, because in a competition or anything like that, like we don't want to have a dissertation with our players. We just want to have <laughs> right. a couple easy things to say to them that then helps them reset. Oh, here, so I, you just spurred me to remember a story, which was kind of interesting. It was um, it was the sectional finals of tennis, and so this is like in California. That's akin to a state championship in a lot of places because it's like it's 145 schools. So um, so we're in this championship match, and the other coach has accused me of using signals to send in and coaching at an at, at a time that's not legal. And, oh, I just thought that was hilarious because I was like, wow, how long would it take me to teach these kids signals? And then would they look at them? You know, <laughs> would they even look over to receive a signal from me? That's a battle I, would, I don't think I'd ever want to fight. So now I'm being accused of something that's ridiculous that I would never even think of doing because it just wouldn't work, especially with this particular team because they were kind of a rebellious group. So I just thought that was hilarious. Yeah, so this dissertation, yeah, right? I don't, I'm not, I don't have time for dissertations, you know. Sometimes I think 
telling a story to the kids is good as long as it's something that pertains to them it's valid and it's relevant to you know an issue that they're dealing with at the moment when when we teach try to teach things ad nauseum in a lecture that doesn't that isn't connected to something an issue that they're dealing with right now it's we're really losing them at that time yeah i i mean i'm i'm thankful for twitter because it's made me have to be more concise with what i'm thinking about in terms of when i put tweets out there but also when i'm coaching because if i can say it in that little amount then i think well how can i make it even shorter what was it the quote like i sent you a letter but it would have been shorter but i didn't have enough time um i know i just butchered that one mm. interesting but, um, okay anyway, since you said that let's let me riff off of that for for a moment because um i forget where i heard this but it was great um if you can say what you're saying in 10 seconds or 42 words that's the attention span that people have for one block of information 10 seconds or 42 words so that works really well on a tennis match because there's a changeover of 90 seconds when you establish this pattern that your player can come over and you will talk to them for 10 seconds it's kind of hard to, to for them to refuse uh listening to you for 10 seconds you know they they then they then have to come to grips with their unown reasonableness. If you say, can you listen to me for 10 seconds? It's hard for them to say no. And if they do, I would right. tease them immediately. I'm like, wow, you're really open-minded. That's terrific. You're going to go far like that. <laughs> Sarcasm. <laughs> well, I mean, it's just the truth. I mean, you know, if you can't right. listen to someone for 10 seconds, you got a serious problem. Yeah, I'd sit here and think about some of the some of the kids that that um, that I've had the privilege to coach and the difficulties with that sometimes. But yeah, that is what it is. And usually by the end of the time, you know, they're they're listening because they have gotten better, they have improved, and they're like, "Oh, that coach really does care about me, mm. and he doesn't just care about wins." So, yes, uh, yes, that's one of the things. But, yeah, you know, and that that's another one. Care about winning. That's another one of those great phrases too. Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So, um, you know, you, you that's a battle worth fighting. I mean, you it's and it takes time to establish that trust with players. So, developing the trust and expressing the fact that you care about them more as people than you do as players. Um, you know, then then what happens is they'll start running trying to run through walls for you. Yeah. So, Bill, I wouldn't be sitting here talking with you across the country today. If I didn't start reading books again, one of my favorite quotes, Jim Rohn likes to say, a formal education will make you a living, but a self-education will make you rich. Mm. So can you share, I mean, I'll, I'll put links to your books, but can you share with us some other books that you think will help us become better coaches or better people that can be sports related or from a different genre? Well, I love Jim Rohn too. So um, look up Jim Rohn people. And you know, if you, <laughs> Yeah, if you munch on a Jim Rohn quote once a day, you'll go far. Um, let's see. There's, you know, there's a there's a book that I love, and it's from the '80s. It's called "The Sweet Spot in Time" by John Jerome. And John Jerome was a friend of Jim Fix, the runner guy, you know, that had the heart attack. But um, and so he was part of that whole aerobic, you know fad generation but john this book the sweet spot in time it's the philosophy of sports and it's timeless information so i mean some stuff would be dated because he'll be referring to athletes you know from bygone eras and whatnot but that book really got me to think very deeply about you know the the human being in the sports world and all the different aspects of the system of being an athlete and a coach so so that's one of them um <clears throat> you know uh, 
there's a book, uh, Successful Coaching by Reiner Martins, um, and he is one of the great uh, sports psychology researchers that there's been. He made some landmark studies in uh, competitive anxiety that pretty pretty much um, set the standard for a lot of that. So he's a he's amazing. Um, so successful coaching by Reiner Martins, and that's Human Kinetics. And I know that that's a Human Kinetics book. So you can that's another great resource. You can go to Human Kinetics, and I have yet to see a book produced by them that wasn't outstanding. So you can go shop around and find something in your specialty and I would be very surprised to hear any negative comment about a book they produce. Um, and then finally, there's a guy, Jim Lair, who's also a terrific sports psychologist and um, one of his all-time classics is mental toughness training for sports. I lost you for a second. Um, so Jim Lair, can you hear me now? How's this? Hello? Hello, Jason. We are having technical difficulties. Okay, can you hear me now? There. Yeah, okay, now good. we're back. All right. So back. so there's Jim Lair uh, who wrote uh, Mental Toughness Training for Sports. And anything by Jim is also outstanding. That He is one of the great people in all of sports. Um, L-O-E-H-R is how you spell his last name. L-O-E-H-R. So um, Jim Lair, terrific guy. Actually, Jim Lair worked with Dan Jansen, the, the speed skater um, who you know had that tragic crash in the one Olympic in his specialty and then, and helped him kind of put things back together again and come back out into the next Olympics where he then crashed again. And then what is, what happens? What ends up happening? He ends up getting gold in his least favorite event that he was not anywhere close to being a, a favorite for. So that's amazing stuff right there. And so Jim, Jim's work with Dan Jansen, you know, really showed. So those are a couple. Uh, those are a few. I mean, I, those are. And those are. I was gonna say those are three books that I haven't read. So that's um, that's awesome. You, you just added to my my reading list. I appreciate that. <laughs> awesome. And then you know, when, so, uh, yeah, play, play sports right, right? So there's the shameless pitch. All right, very good. I will have that book and a link to it um, in the show notes on the wish on the clipboard. Oh, uh, well, you know website. what? It's, it's not quite ready yet. It should be ready by the end of May, 2017 here. So if you're listening to this later, you know, and it's after May, um, the end of May. So anyway, yeah, it's, it's in the fi I'm final edits right now and it should be published in the next week or two, maybe. Awesome. Awesome. Well, then once it comes out, I'll have the link on the page if this goes out before then. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So, Bill, you know, share with us. You, you shared about the book, but share with us your website, um, you know, other places where people can find you if they want to get coaching, clinics you're involved with, maybe some speaking. Just just tell us more about that kind of stuff, what you got going on. Yeah, my my website is 720degreecoaching.org, 720 degree coaching spelled out. Uh, dot org and you know my website's not really uh, you know it, it's fine to look at I mean you can see what I look like if you if you can't see me here on one of these other things but um, you know so but you can send me an email anytime at 720 degree coaching at gmail.com and I'm available uh, for keynote speaking I'm available at, to help you solve a problem. Anybody listening can have a 20 minute call with me for free um, to help solve a sticky issue that you have in coaching. Um, and then, you know, in that 20 minutes, there'll be a very soft pitch, you know, to possibly become a client. You know, it's not going to be any hard sell. Um, you can find me on Facebook. So, you know, find me on Facebook, friend me, you know, watch all my crazy stuff. Um, on um, Twitter, I'm at Kid Play Sports. Kid Play Sports. 
Uh, so you can find me there. And um, on Instagram, I'm Bill Patton 720 So reach out, comment on my stuff. I try to th uh, throw some personal stuff in there a little bit. You know, I like to take crazy pictures. But most all of my stuff is directed with coaching and or any cool stuff I run into. Awesome. Well, you know, we'll, we'll, again, we'll put this stuff out on the website so that people want to, you know, find you. Wonderful. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, the fun of taped podcasts or live shows. Um, I'm surprised the dog hasn't barked yet. So anyway. Yeah, my cats have been yeah. pretty well behaved, so I'm, I'm appreciative of that. <laughs> So, Bill, you know, thanks for taking time out of your day to share with the clipboard community. Uh, give us one parting piece of advice. You shared the best way we can find you, and then we'll say goodbye. Parting piece of advice. Um, wow. Parting piece of advice. I, I don't know. I think let's go back. Okay. The parting piece of advice is to be a collaborative coach. Um, you're probably the choir here, so you know. So you're probably you're you're the one that listens to the stuff. So you're always trying to learn, and and so the people who I would like to give the advice to are not listening. So you. You, the good and right coaches who always are learning, reach out to a coach who's on the fence, right? You know, draw somebody into this community of collaborative coaches. Show them the way. And then the coaches that lack integrity and will cheat you blind and all that, pick one good fight a year and go all the way. Um, you know, one one really good, I'm sorry, that's not acceptable, not around here, not around me, will draws a red line in the sand and shows people that's not acceptable, so knock it off right now. Um, if you try to fight that fight more than once a year, you're going to get a reputation for being trouble. So um, make sure you're absolutely right before fighting that battle, you know? Um, and so there it is. Draw, draw one new on the fence person in and fight one good battle and the whole coaching community is gonna be transformed. Awesome, awesome. And yeah, you gotta be, you gotta be ready for the, the fallout, the pushback when you fight that battle, but it's well worth it, it's well worth it. So yes, Bill, sir. I want to thank you again for taking time out of your day to spend with us here on Whistle on the Clipboard. Um, thank you for your, you know, all that you all that you've done for coaches and what you're going to continue to do with the books that you're writing. So the coaching community salutes you. We'll catch you on a court, or maybe at a clinic, or maybe even at a keynote. All right, very good. Thank you so much, Jason. I appreciate it.